Welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Mike Hornby this morning. Rob is, um, I don't know what he's doing today. He must have something going on. He's, but, uh, they, they have their first football get together oh, they practice and he, that's the only t- only morning they have all year but he hey, he loves his football <laughs> he just told me you're in on wednesday and here's what we got going on you got to find some guests uh, i'm joined by bill stubblefield and maria lawrenson and our next guest is uh from the democratic party um <laughs> we 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 call him flu who flu hardy uh sean flu hardy uh can you hear sean Yes, good morning. Good morning, sir. Um, welcome into the show. Have you been on before, Sean? I believe I have, but it's been a while. I mean, you guys must need some ratings, so finally I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Sean does love himself, and he is the loudest person on the floor. No. He, he Louder got- than John Doyle? Well, John's not on the floor. I know. John's not on. John I haven't been on, on with John. So, but but Sean is usually the 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 <laughs> person out there leading the charge on 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 the uh, on the left hand side of the thing, um, and he he is very witty, and often makes me laugh and, and cry on the floor. Sean, <laughs> I try not to look at you while I'm speaking because <laughs> you know you don't hide it very well. You probably are a horrible poker player. <laughs> I, I'll, I'm pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, what are you working on um, over the, the, the off-season? What are you working on for next session? What do you hope to accomplish in, in, in the upcoming session, being in the super minority? Well, I know I think the biggest topic we've had that many people have been discussing throughout the state is Rayleigh's Law, and it's something that uh, is near and dear to me, and I think that you've been supportive in the past, and it's one of the few things that we've seen on the House floor where there was true bipartisan support. Can you give us a rundown of the history of that and and what that was about? And then we can kind of talk about what happened on the floor and and, and go into those details. So I I was contacted a few years ago by a former teacher of Rayleigh Browning. Rayleigh Browning was an eight-year-old child out of Nicholas County who was in public school and um, while in public school was yanked out of public school to be homeschooled by her abusive father and family. Long story short, she ends up being, this abuse continues in the darkness of night at, at home because she's no longer in public school. And this is all while a CPS report is pending. So there is an investigation underway, yet in a loophole in West Virginia, even if there is an investigation or reports out there, you can still take the child out of the public school to the, home, the homeschool environment where, you, like I said, you're in the darkness of night. So uh, Rayleigh Browning was found dead at her home. After this, after this process took place, and here we are years later still fighting for Rayleigh's law. Uh, and in that time, three individuals in that home have been uh, not only going through the trial process, convicted and sentenced, and we had just last session the first movement for Rayleigh's law, which took a floor amendment by myself, and, and luckily many Republicans joined in to get it out of the House. So we finally got Rayleigh's law out of the House, over to the Senate, but Senate Education Committee did not take it up. I'm not going to speak for them, but I was, you know, this thing has made has made national news at this point, and yet we're still working on it here in West Virginia. And, and this this really it, this bill is not against homeschooling. This is a bill to protect children from abuse. Correct? Absolutely. If you are already homeschooling, it wouldn't even apply to you. This is just right. under the limited circumstances where uh, you know a child is in public school, and and if there's a pending report out there, if there's if there's you know abuse going on, we want to make sure we go through and check all the boxes. That's protecting children. That's what this is about. And I believe you did get uh, a lot of Republicans uh, to come to come on to your side. I believe it was a floor amendment in another bill. Will you be running this bill as a standalone bill again this uh, this upcoming sure. session? I think we would run the, the updated version. You know, we we tightened it up um, on the floor, and um, I'd love to see it run run as a tightened version in the house and and get to the committee process. You know, the frustrating part about this is it shouldn't have to go through this floor amendment process where, you know, I'm using the rules to my advantage as best I can. It should just go through the regular committee process. You know, I don't give a crap who's running the bill. If it's a Democrat, Republican, if it's a good idea, it's a good idea. It should run. Uh, We have a lot of individuals and certain committees who keep things off. And we have powerful lobbyists on that side that uh, are lobbying against the bill. So, you know, that's, it's, it's a shame, and it shouldn't have to make national news. And we've had many instances in the state where similar things have happened. We're finding kids in sheds, right? We just had what happened with Kennedy in, in uh, Boone County. 
these are things where if we have the protections in place, it may not happen. It could actually save lives. Bill? Sean, on the surface, this sounds like a, a no-brainer protecting the children. What was the objection? Why did uh, some, some parties object to it? The objection came from more of the national scene than the local scene. There's groups out there. The homeschool lobby is very, very powerful, not just in West Virginia, but nationwide. And if they view a bill adversarial to the homeschool system we have in place, they come out against it full bore. And that's what happened here. I mean, we were getting emails from national homeschool groups, and I'd respond, please tell me where you live in West Virginia. <laughs> you know, it, these aren't people who are actually from West Virginia. But the influence came in from the national level. And I believe that kept the bill off the agenda in the House committee. It certainly kept it from moving. And we're talking for probably three years plus now on this bill. And it is a no-brainer. Factually, if you read it and actually apply it to the current law, it essentially closes a loophole. However, when national groups come in and they spend money lobbying and they target certain bills, bills don't move. And I believe that's what happened here. So it never got to the floor? It stayed in the committee? It stayed in committee. So the only way it got to the floor was a bill came through that opened up that code section where I have it uh, designated under the homeschool law. And because that, that code section was opened up, I made a floor amendment to, to bring in my bill, Rayleigh's law, to the homeschool bill that was pending. And the, and the pushback, I guess, from what I saw, and again, I, I did support support Sean's uh, amendment in the end when it came through the House. The pushback was it, this makes homeschoolers look bad or it's against homeschools. I, and I don't think, in my opinion, that was the intent of this. And, and the intent of this bill is not to persecute homeschoolers. It's to protect children from bad parents pulling them out of school when that, they're under investigation. In I kind of wish that we would have had Senator Rucker still available to right. talk about this because, I mean, she's obviously been a homeschool advocate. She's homeschooled all of her children, sure. I believe. And she's wrong. And, and she's wrong. Um, you know, so how it's it seems crazy that um, that this would be um, perceived simply because of a huh, I, I'm saying something ridiculous that because of a lobbyist group coming in and saying don't do this so um, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that um, yeah. well here's the thing and, and just to prove the point even more when I say we tighten up the bill so the bill or in its original form uh, there were questions as to length of time in other words uh, the question would be well if there's an investigation you know how long could this take well I mean Let's be real. Do these investigations take a super long time? No. But do we have a flawless CPS system? Absolutely not. And that's more reason why we should have this bill, because right now we're relying on a flawed system that quite honestly needs the uh, you know, overhaul at this point. However, what we did is we put in time parameters. So essentially, if it was this situation, it would get kicked to the front of the line of these pending CPS reports and things of that nature. And there would be a set timeline in place. I believe it, I want to say it was 10 or 20 days that this would have to take place and you had to find probable cause that they're, that they're through the investigation process, that there was merit to these claims. So not only did we tighten the bill up, we actually improved the process itself when it involves children from going from public school to homeschool so that the homeschool lobby, I didn't know what leg they could stand on at that point. So, you know, in its original form, there were some questions, but by the time it came over to the Senate last year, it was super tight. Uh, in fact, you know, it was, it was. I thought it was ironclad to the point that this thing's going to get done. It's already making a ton of press. We have all the momentum, and unfortunately, it never made the Senate uh, Education Committee agenda. Yeah, speak to that process, uh, Sean, because obviously when, when you did propose it in its original form, there were a lot of questions. But it took us, uh, I want to say, what, 24 hours to... Uh, negotiations between you and, and, and some Republican members to really tighten that up um, yeah. and, and make it feasible for all. And, and you really pulled a lot of Republicans over to your side for that. Can you explain uh, kind of how that worked behind the scenes? Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, the process itself was probably one of my proudest moments on the House floor since since I've been there, because it essentially we essentially worked the bill up as you should in the committee. We basically had a committee as a whole 
on the House floor. And uh, from the introduction phase during the during the floor process to you know pulling the bill back and allowing us to work on it and come back out with a bipartisan version, you know, we tightened it up. We put in time constraints. We improved the process overall, and that's that should happen in the committee, right? Every bill you introduce in the committee, nine times out of ten, especially if it has any controversy or if it has substance to it, is not coming out in its original written form. It comes out modified through the committee process. Questions get asked. They get answered. There's testimony. None of that happened with Rayleigh's Law, so we had to do it on the floor itself. And it was one of the greatest moments that I've seen since I've been in Charleston, where everybody put politics aside. We were we were strategically working on a way to protect children in the state, and that's why I garnered so much attention because people who have been working there for years are coming up to me being like, "I've never seen anything like that." It's like, no, I haven't either, because that's good government at work. That was you know one of the times we could be proud of what we're doing, and that's what happened. Um, so you know, I'm hoping this time around. We have this newer version, a bipartisan version, you know, put the politics aside, run the bill through the committee process. If there's any outstanding questions still, let's answer them. But let's get it over to the Senate. And there's got to be a middle ground there that they can agree to. I- I've heard the comments from certain senators that were against it. And I think that they may have been against the original version or they're against whatever papers handed to them by lobbyists. You know, these are the, the versions they're against. But are they against what happened in a bipartisan manner on the House floor? I highly doubt it. Did you have a chance to talk to Patricia Rutger or Senator Rutger uh, about this particular bill? I did not. No, I've only seen the comments that followed on the radio and uh, in the press. Yeah, I think the opposition may, may have been that it was an amendment in, in another bill, but I think it's a standalone bill. I think this uh, has enough uh, oomph to get to the to get to the finish line, if you will. So, Sean, you're obviously very passionate about this particular issue. Um, and it seems strange that you, and I get it, I get it that there are lots of other forces at work, but um, is this the year um, for, um, for Rayleigh's Law to, to be passed? I think so. I mean, the, the stars are aligning for it, uh, but, you know, I've, I've learned in this process not to take anything for granted and, and presume things will happen. Curveballs happen all the time, and and you can't get too uh, complacent. So, but I, I do. I do know this: we've had our first up and down vote on Rayleigh's Law, and it passed overwhelmingly. It was, it, in you know, there was no opposition by at the end of the day to it. It goes over to the Senate. Sure, it was incorporated into another bill, but the only reason it was incorporated into another bill is simply because it was blocked from the the the, the, the proper legislative process. Now, if we give it the proper legislative process and we tighten the bill up, now's the time to get it done. Especially, child care is such a focus right now in West Virginia and protecting our children. I am tired of reading the news and seeing and hearing about kids being found, abused, and neglected, and nobody knowing about it or reports were made and nothing was followed up. So let's put more protections in. This is just one piece of the puzzle. We got to start filling that puzzle up. We've left too many pieces sitting on the table. We got to fill the puzzle and and help our kids, and so that we're not reading about this stuff every day. You know, this is not even in my district. I was reached out to by by the teacher who was you know uh, looking for somebody to kind of carry the torch on this. I'm not from Nicholas County. I couldn't identify the school if I drove by it, but it was put on my plate. You know, I, I don't know why, but I'm going to champion it as if it happened in my own backyard and that's what's happening now so according to this bill then sean what whose responsibility or is a shared responsibility to make sure all these checks are in place so that this does not happen again i i, I think you could argue it's a shared responsibility look uh, our public school teachers our mandatory reporters, if they suspect that abuse is going on in the home, they are obligated and mandated to make those reports. And that doesn't happen in the homeschool setting. It only happens in the public school setting. So the report is made, and then it kicks over to the investigatory process. And because of the time parameters we have in place, certain things need to happen. There needs to be communication to the superintendent. More people are alerted than currently are, so there's more eyes and ears on the situation, so they can monitor, hey, look, this investigation, it needs to wrap up within so many days because this child, if it doesn't wrap up, is going to be put in a homeschool setting. 
and if there's allegations that the setting is an abusive setting, we want to make sure that we've investigated it and find out whether that that investigation uh, was merited. And if there's evidence of, of abuse, and if so, we can't keep this kid in a dark environment. And that's the first thing child abusers do is they want to isolate the child. And we want to keep that from happening. And that's exactly what this would do. And I think to, to add on to that, I think you, you, you talk to um, some of the educators and some of the truancy officers. There are bad parents out there that have truant kids and they're using this loophole where they can pull their child out, say you're 20 days truant, they can pull their child out of school, put them in a homeschool setting, not actually do any homeschooling, yep. then re submit them the following year until they're truant again and then use this loophole to get away with with basically bad parenting and, and um I, I think this is one of those laws that uh could have really uh, helped yeah. most board of education let me sean let me shift to another yeah. uh, some of your other interests yeah one you is, guys are really yeah bringing me down this morning let's talk about <laughs> something that's, uh, yeah you know uh you you've <laughs> also have some interest uh in uh curbing uh, sports betting sports wagering would you speak to that please in in promoting it or curbing it uh, curbing it no, I think he promotes I, I, it. I promote it. <laughs> oh, okay, I misread. No, sport, I misread. Okay. Sports betting. No, no. Sports I have the betting, word uh, banning certain persons from <laughs> sports wagering. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, we passed a bill uh, last session which would ban people who are harassing players. So we've had many circumstances, especially Ohio led the charge on this, where, you know, everybody's betting on sports these days and everybody runs their phones and they're on social media and they will say anything. You know, I, I think my colleague there would tell you he probably gets emails and messages online. I know I do, but I'm a I'm pretty loud guy with a lot of enemies. But, you know, um, you get these messages, and as you, if you're betting on sports and you lose a bet and you go and talk a, talk trash that's harassing a player online, that's a view football player, say they, they drop a ball, they fumble, whatever it may be. And, you know, betting on sports is a privilege, and it's not a right. You don't have to go through a judicial process. So we had nothing on the books that would allow, say, if there was harassment taking place on a player at WVU or whatever university it may be, that we could say, you know what, you've gone too far. We're removing your ability to bet on sports, and you're going to lose your account. Now, under the process we have through this bill that was passed, we are one of the few states that's coming together with others nearby, like Ohio, and we're saying, hey, look, if you have a pattern of conduct and you're harassing, threatening players, you know, I'm going to kill you or anything else, you're done. We're not going to put up with that. And that and that was promoted by the NCAA. This was a bill that I introduced that uh, had uh, the, the um, entire NCAA conglomerate supporting. They sent a letter of support to the House. We got it out of the House, passed the Senate overwhelmingly. And it's just another you know, tool in the toolbox for our West Virginia lottery. They're responsible for regulating sports betting to say, hey, look, we're going to take it upon ourselves and – this is something that if, if you're harassing a player, we're going to make sure you're not allowed to do this anymore. So that, that bill actually came up in rulemaking review, uh, Sean, and I, I'd love to get your opinion. I, we, we haven't talked about this, but I'll just throw it out there publicly. Um, we've been approached to say that fantasy sports should be exempt from the whole sports betting um, Process. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? And it, you know, I definitely, I have some angst with it. Uh, but what are your thoughts on on that? So this topic, as we discussed, um, I am president of the national or, national council of legislators from gaming states, and also my former colleague, who's now in the Senate, Jason Barrett, serves on the board. He's in your neck of the woods over there. Look at that bipartisanship we have going on. So <laughs> you know, uh, we. We have talked about this, and it's a really gray area. So I tend to think if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's pretty much a duck. Right. And that's kind of where that falls in. Fantasy sports, you know, there's there's groups out there, underdog prize picks and others, that uh, are essentially offering up what looks like sports betting, and they argue under the law that it is not. And there's some validation to that, and it's something that we probably should go through the process and have, you know, a real legislative discussion on. But, um, you know, it, should they have a separate license? Then possibly. Is that a, a, an attempt to raise new revenue? Could be. It's something we should look at. But more. it should I mean, still go I, through the casinos then, correct? I mean, the, they're, well, they're regulated properly. Well, related, if it's another sports betting license, yes, it should be right. tethered to the casinos. We have to protect our brick-and-mortar casinos. They employ a lot of people. And it, the system we have in place since we've had it is one that has been 
quite frankly, copied and pasted into other states because it's that good. It's working very well. We're raising a lot of money, whether it be from sports betting or from iGaming, which raises even more money. West Virginia is looked at one of the leading states in the gaming industry. And it's, it's funny because people tell me, wait a minute, uh, you're a Democrat, you're in a red state, you're pushing all this gaming law. Uh, you know, how's that working out? Like, this is one of the few things that's not politically polarizing. Everything in this country is polarized. Yet when it comes to the gaming industry, it's not. It's truly something that's purple. Nobody pays it to. I don't know uh, my my colleagues at, at Nickel G's. I don't know if they're Democrat or Republican. I don't ask them. <laughs> These are things where I just say, hey, if you're pro-gaming and you want to protect the consumer and raise new revenue for your state without raising people's taxes, here's a way to do it. Sean, let me see if I can get one more in. We're about to run out of time. Uh, HB 5510 clarifying law regarding crime or witness tampering. I've read this three or four times. I have absolutely no idea what it says. Uh, would you, what does it do? Why was it necessary? Uh, on witness tampering, I'm not familiar with, with that one. Uh, uh, that's 5510. I'd have to, I'd have to look at it. I wasn't, well, I thought you were one of the, hey, we're going to talk about this. Some, you're on one of the, tampering? you're one of the sponsors of it. I have to review that one. I don't, okay. I don't recall that one. I, as a lawyer, you know, obviously witness tampering is something that's a serious offense if you have a case pending and, uh, you know, we're going through the judicial process. I'd have to look at that one and, and see what the, the parameters were on it. Uh, a lot of those bills come through Judiciary Committee. If, uh, when it comes to the committee process, we add we add the sponsors to the bill if it comes out a, a good product. But, you know, a lot of these legal bills, is a, gray, a lot of them are in a gray area, again, that uh, require a lot of people looking at and going, wait a minute, is this, is this something that should be pursued? But if law enforcement's behind it and the legal community's behind it, then chances are uh, it's something that, that we need to do to, to protect individuals. And witness tampering is a really serious offense, and it's something that doesn't get talked about very often, but it is part of the legal process to make sure that that we're not intimidating those who are part of it as well. And, it, and also when it comes to the, the jury process, we want to make sure that this is completely separate from any, um, any liabilities going forward for sure. So Sean, big picture, looking at West Virginia as a whole, you have uh, 11, I believe you have 11 Democrats uh, right now. What do you see come November? Do you see the Dems uh, gaining seats, losing seats? What's your prediction looking forward? And we won't hold you to it. We can caucus in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, do you think you're going to lose seats or pick up seats? Potentially. I mean, there are a few races, obviously, we're looking at to pick up. Uh, you know, I know it's a do you have an opponent? president. Of course I do. Okay. I mean, I always have an opponent and I'll take it seriously and <laughs> I'll run a real race and, and I'm confident I'll be successful. You want me back. I know that. So, you know, <laughs> st still waiting for that, for that check to come in the mail. But, you know, look, it, it's a tough year for Democrats. It's always a tough year, especially a presidential year. But, you know, I, I'm not sending checks to the national campaign like your current uh, nominee did. So <laughs> things things are looking pretty good and there's there's actually at least a spark of uh of substance back in the party and people are motivated and that's good i think that's good for not just west virginia but the nation as a whole I, you know i don't like those those elections that are just signed sealed and delivered and rubber stamped everybody what? should have a competitive race and get out there and work it but uh, yeah i think uh, we'll come back with probably probably the same number maybe pick up two or three and okay. i'll tell you what nobody will probably go on the record and say this but good government requires a you know sort of a middle ground. I think it's, t it's tough to govern from the polars. It's tough to govern from the far left. It's tough to govern from the far right. You get better bills when more people have a chance to address them. And I think if we had a 60-40 legislature, we probably would have better conversations and better bills coming out of it, but we don't. And, you know, I think there's plenty who would admit to that off the phone, but not on the phone, that, hey, look, uh, it would be a little better if we had some more middle ground here. What about the, uh, what are your thoughts on that? We've got about two minutes uh, left. What are your thoughts about the governor's race? Do you, do you think uh, Steve, uh, you know, has he raised enough money? Does Joe jump in the no, race? He what needs to raise money. I, look, I'm, I completely agree he needs to raise money. Right. Uh, that's, that's an issue. And obviously, in Morrissey, um, I won't be voting for him, but he's, he's done a good job at raising money. He always has. He works it. Uh, it's just the way the, the way of the world. It's just that if people look at it and know that there's a war chest there, and I think a lot of people are hesitant to donate uh, to Steve, and who, who's running a tough campaign as best he can. But yeah, he needs to raise more money, and it's it's hard to do in this environment. There are only you know certain 
certain races. Even the one that I really like is Glenn Elliott running against Jim Justice for the U.S. Senate. Do you think that'll be close? He is gaining traction. He's working his butt off. Everybody in the Eastern Panhandle needs to look him up. He's a smart guy. He's a Georgetown Law grad. He's a Wharton Business School grad. He's the former mayor of the city of Wheeling. He's a friend of mine. He's as good as it gets, salt the earth, dude. You know what? He pays his damn bills. (laughs) And, And it's, you know... Let's be real about that. Our governor has many yeah. flaws. Our current governor has many flaws. He has said on the record he doesn't even want to go to D.C. He has no interest in it. We know that. He barely shows up in Charleston. So, you know, I, I really support Glenn Elliott. I think he's a great candidate. He's a great human, and people need to be aware of him. And, look, there's plenty of red flags to say, maybe, Jim, your time's up. Maybe we'll just we'll, we'll go somewhere else with this one because, uh, right. I mean, Who's buying the Greenbrier? Right. You put, you Sean, know. I want to I want to thank you. We're, we're we're absolutely out of time. I want to thank you for your time. I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you, and I will see you at interims. You are Appreciate listening it. to WRNR and TV Tech, and we'll see you in a couple of minutes.